Hi, this is Adam Diaz with Back to Radio, and you're listening to Fast Facts, the fast and the factual Diaz's Adam Sprintacular series where you'll learn something interesting in about five minutes or so. For real this time. Ever since my medical retirement, I've dreamed of two things. Moving to Belize and settling down, because why not? I'm technically retired after all and to buy an alpaca as a pet. Every once in a while, or every Sunday drive to the in-laws who's keeping count, I bring up the alpaca thing to the missus, and she refutes that alpacas aren't pet material. So to prove just how wrong she is, and to compare apples to oranges, we're gonna learn about the tale of Signalman Jack, and time willing, other not pet animals that are quite useful to have around. You've heard the saying, if you put enough monkeys in a room and give them each a typewriter, they'll make a better podcast than this guy, Well, forget monkeys, because if you give a one baboon 20 cents a day and half a bottle of beer a week, they'll become employee of the month for the Cape Town Port Elizabeth Railway Service in South Africa. This incredible story of the assumed descendant of Rafiki starts with a one James Jumper Wide, a signalman who became a double amputee after a slip and fall while doing his thing, jumping between rail cars. The year was 1881. Old Mr. Wide, even though being a double amputee, wasn't able to retire from a worksite accident. Instead, he went into town with his double peg legs and wheelchair and saw a Chakma baboon pulling carts to market. This set off the light bulbs, and James Wide purchased this cart pushing primate for the purpose of becoming his assistant. James was a signalman. After his accident, there was no way for this now disabled man to perform his prior duties as a guard. His newfound pet slash assistant had proven quite handy and adept at performing everyday chores such as sweeping and taking out the trash. Additionally, Jack the baboon was quite adept at taking his master to and from work, work in which the man was required to listen for train whistles and pull levers in accordance with which track switches related to each whistle count. Jack, apparently wanting to continue to prove his purchase as a great investment, quickly learned how to do James's job as signalman for the Utenhage railway station. Eventually, this Papiao learned the tricks of the trade and could perform his duties unsupervised. That is, until Karen reported James and Jack to the authorities. Now, here's where the story takes a fun turn. Because of the complaint to the company, they sent in the station superintendent to assess the situation. The man was amused at the sight of seeing a baboon doing people things, like honestly, who wouldn't find that awesome? And so the superintendent did what any Chad boss would do and decided to give Jack the signalman's test. This absolute legend of a supervisor tested Jack the baboon and officially certified him as a capable signalman, and then officially hired him with an employee number, paycheck, and benefits. Jack lived the remainder of his life as a loyal and loving companion to his master and as a perfect employee to the company, never once making a single mistake in the nine years he worked for the Cape Town Port Elizabeth Railway Service before he passed away due to consumption. It looks like I definitely have some time to kill, so why not venture into the realm of one of my favorite directors, Wes Anderson, in his movie Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou. What does this movie have to do with animal jobs, you may ask? Those sea turtle research assistants, of course. Well, not actually turtles because they are protected under the Endangered Species Act of the ESA in the United States and tons of nations have agreed in assisting in conservation efforts. But marine animal exploitation, resourcefulness, let's just go with resources, is a thing. The United States Navy's Marine Mammal Program, Mammal? The United States Navy's Marine Mammal Program trains dolphins and sea lions for the use of demining the ocean. In the case of the dolphins, their high intelligence and sonar-like systems assist the Navy in detecting mines at great depths and in low visibility waters. The sea lions? Well, I personally believe it's just an excuse for the squids to play with the water puppies. On a similar, almost off-topic note, can you believe that it's been nearly 24 years since Princess Diana died? She may have passed after a car accident in August of 97, but she very well could have easily been blown up or maimed when she took a walk through a live minefield in Angola in January of that same year. She did this in the hopes to use her fame and the media attention that followed her to help push an international ban on the use of landmines. See, landmines are a major issue in Africa, parts of Asia, and even Eastern Europe. They maim and kill thousands of innocent people a year still to this day. I do even believe that there is a portion of France that is also uninhabitable due to landmines and unexploded ordnance. Our best way of dealing with this crisis is through the use of rats. The Gambian pouch rat to be exact. After nine months of intense training, these rats are used to locate landmines that are then able to be disposed of. 
The process is long, hard, and dangerous, but without the aid of these rodents, it would be much more costly and potentially even more dangerous and most certainly more time consuming. So next time you spot a three foot rat, as long as it isn't drawing the symbol of the horn rat, toss it some peanut butter and cheese because it very well may be a hero. Speaking of rodents, we might as well go into the realm of actual pets with jobs. Chief Mauser is the official government title of the house cat that resides at 10 Downing Street or the British Prime Minister's residence. The tradition of having a Chief Mauser dates back to Henry VIII in the 1500s. And continuing in the realm of actual pets, why not talk about war and dogs? So we all know war is a terrible thing. Throughout history, we have used animals in our battles. The Romans used flaming pigs to wreak havoc on the enemy's lines, Hannibal and the Carthaginians used war elephants, the Parthians used horses to great effect. And always from the beginning of time, man has brought dogs to the battlefield. During the First World War, however, dogs began to serve a more humanitarian role. After the staggering casualties and missing in actions of the Franco-Prussian War, German artist and author Jean Bungartz made it his mission to train dogs to search and track down wounded soldiers. In 1890, he founded the German Association for Medical Dogs. This institution became the model for the International Red Cross to follow at the outbreak of World War I. With this, the Mercy Dog was born. These dogs were trained to search for wounded men on the battlefield and brought with them satchels with water, liquor, and basic medical supplies. The dogs were keen enough to know if a man were too mortally wounded to survive and would either move on or stay with them as a comfort in their final moments. If the dog were able, they would attempt to drag the wounded man back to friendly lines, or at the least take pieces of the injured man's uniform back to the medics and lead a rescue party to the soldier in need. As many as 10,000 of man's best friends served as mercy dogs during the war, and they are attributed with saving as many as 6,000 men or more. The use of mercy dogs was continued into World War II, and even the Korean War, albeit at a much more limited capacity. Today, dogs still serve man in the battlefield, but they also see work as service animals, therapeutic companions, helping those who suffer from seizures, alerting them before they even occur, and even sensing depression, illness, and cancer. So see, getting uh, my family an alpaca or two doesn't seem all that crazy, but maybe a dog would suffice. So thank you for listening to the show. I hope you learned something. As always, make sure to follow on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on new episode postings. We're in the sprint, my friend, and these episodes are going to be flying at you hard and fast. Chock full of that sweet, sweet trivia knowledge. Have any thoughts or a subject you'd like to hear? Go ahead and message me over the Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Back2Radio. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube video if that's how you're listening to this episode. I do love getting your feedback. Being from radio, I just kind of did my thing and hope for the best. Not much feedback from a listener and all. Uh, Except for when I work with the Preston Steve Morning Show, but... I was just an AP, so feedback wasn't actually really for me. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling now, but thank you for listening. Kong beats Godzilla every time. Adios. (laughs) 